tonight at the museum, I'm doing something that I haven't done for quite a long time. I'm giving a lecture. I'm actually giving a lecture on the immigration of Italians coming to America. And uh, I've been very fortunate to have the Lower East Side Preservation Association come in and basically uh, organize this event for us and actually have a full house. So it's a great experience right down here on the Library Street. I hope everybody enjoys it. So good, so quiet. <laughs> Actually, I've been giving. I've been giving. I usually give the lectures during the day to the students that come in, and I have to I'm be honest with you. You can usually lately hear a pin drop in the room. I'm really, and I'm surprised um, because I remember teaching in the classroom, and it wasn't always like that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was. It was. It's, it's, a, it's a present surprise. Anyway, I'm going to turn the the microphone over to Richard Moses, who has a few words to say to you. So, Richard. Uh, thanks, Dr. Schultz. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight to our event uh, and being ready for my Italian here. Nueva, Nueva, Nueva Vita, Nueva, Nueva, Nueva. Nueva. <laughs> I get confused with my Bosch Spanish, so it's a very bad mingling here. Uh, Italian American uh, immigration and culture in New York City's Lower East Side. So um, uh, I'm with the Lower East Side Preservation Initiative. Uh, we're a group of uh, preservationists, architects, uh, community activists who are um, trying to preserve the historic architecture and culture of New York's historic Lower East Side, which actually starts at around 14th Street and goes all the way down below Chinatown, uh, Broadway, and, and, and to the uh, east, basically. And so uh, this has been a very exciting time for us now. We uh, just recently had the East Village uh, Lower East Side Historic District, um, ratified by the New York City Council. Uh, this is a district that runs from uh, about uh, 2nd Street up to uh, St. Mark's Place uh, with a spine along uh, 2nd Avenue. So that's a very exciting thing for us. Uh, we feel that the, uh, the Landmarks Commission, the city, is finally paying a little bit more attention to the importance of this area uh, historically, both for our city and for our country. So uh, we're very uh, happy about that. And uh, we're also very excited, of course, about tonight's event. So without uh, too much more ado, uh, here's uh, Dr. Shelsa, um, president and founder, as you know, of the Italian American Museum. Thank you very much. Hey, everybody. At least half of you in the room, if not more ado. My name is Joseph Shelsa. I am the president and founder of the Italian American Museum here on Mulberry Street, um, <clears throat> which, of course, as you know, has been here now since 2008. Got to give you a little bit of background in terms of that before I actually start with the lecture. Um, the museum started in 2001 when we were chartered by the University of the State of New York. We were chartered as an educational institution, um, the first Italian American museum to be chartered in the United States of America. It sounds strange because there have been so many Italians that have immigrated to the United States, over 25 million, they tell me, um, can trace some lineage today with the people living in America to, to, their, to, the, to Italy, um, or what was Italy, or what parts of Italy, even before it was Italy. But, and I'll talk about that in a little bit, but to have the idea, I think, what happened was that we came of age. Um, in 1999, I did an exhibition at the New York Historical Society. It was known as the Italians of New York, Five Centuries of Struggle and Achievement. Anybody in this room see that exhibit? I took yeah. my children to that. Yeah. It was a children's section. Yeah. It was a one. My was, grandmother's wedding dress. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So you know the few of you, yeah, the few of you that were here were actually there and some participated. My grandfather's wine press was in that exhibit, and you know it's it was the Italians of New York. That's the poster that was on the subways and buses, and I found out that there was a real opportunity to engage people, to get them involved. And make them and help them to understand more about this experience. And to be honest about it, you know what? You know, just like all other 
professors, you know, you get involved with these types of activities because you have some personal interest. Now, I have a tendency of sharing my personal interest with everybody else, so that's why we ended up having a museum. I mean, my mother's collection that she had, that she saved, was the basis, was the beginnings of the museum. I had it, unfortunately she passed away in 1992, but when she passed away, every little object that she had saved had notes on it, and was and dates on it, and everything. And, you know, it was just a wonderf wonderful, for me, to have that to remember, and I realized that that was wonderful for me, and that by doing something like this, it would be wonderful for our community. I think it is, um, and it's not only wonderful for the Italian-American community, it's, it's wonderful for the non-Italian community as well, because they get a chance to learn and to see what this experience was all about, and understand the real Italian experience in America. Understand the real Italian experience in America. Um, why they came here, which is what we're gonna talk about this evening, and what happened to them once they got to the Lower East Side. So, and of course, this was once the largest Little Italy in the United States, the largest. And by 1933, East Harlem became larger. But prior to that, this was the largest Italian-American community in the United States. Um, it was huge. It wasn't just one or two blocks like we have today. It used to be three blocks a few week, a few years ago. I was gonna say a few weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> and it's getting smaller every day. It's getting smaller every day. And that's progress, and you can't, do, you can't do much about it. My grandparents, I mean, I have roots here. My grandparents were married in Old St. Patrick's Cathedral. My father was baptized in Old St. Patrick's Cathedral. His baptismal gown is in the fourth showcase, by the way, on the bottom. And their marriage life, marriage certificate in Italian from Old St. Patrick's in, is in there as well. So but that was in 1908 and 1910. Um, they since after that, they moved out of here as they got more successful, and they moved up to the, to the country to the Bronx. <laughs> the Northeast Bronx was like the country. When I, when I grew up there as a kid, I, I thought I was in the country because there was so much vacant land. And I thought everybody was a farmer because everybody just had these little plots of land, which they couldn't have down here on Mulberry Street, right? which, and which is a big reason as to why they went there. Because guess what? The people that came here mostly were farmers. You know, They came from the agricultural south of, of Italy. Which, we're gonna, which again, I'm gonna be talking about again in a minute. Anyway, so I wanted to give you a little bit about my, my lineage, my family history, that's a very small amount. I am so much into this, just like you are, that I have now hired a genealogist, and probably sometime in the fall, I will give you another lecture on, if anybody's interested besides me, on my, fam <laughs> on my family, and from the early parts of the, uh, the centuries that that preceded us. I mean, I've gone back now to 1811, I'm going back further. So we'll see what happens. Anyway, without further ado, let's talk about Italy and what was once before it was Italy. Now, what I have up here on, on the boards for us to see is what Italy looks like today. This is the 20 regions of Italy. And you have, of course, all the way up Trentino up in the north, all the way down to the south, you have Sicily. Sardinia, Calabria. But most of the Italians that came to the United States, and the mass immigration was between 1880 and 1920, came from what they call the Mezzogiorno, which was the southern part of Italy. Everything south of Rome. Lazio is the region where Rome is. And everything south is where they mostly came from. Um, from Abruzzo, most of, a lot of the Abruzzes came after World War II, actually, but there were some before. But definitely from Campania, Baslegata, Calabria, and Sicily. Campania is where Naples is. Campania is the region of Naples. And uh, this is uh, an, important, an important area because this, the port of Naples was a major port of debarkation. Well, the two major ports for the, for the Italians leaving at that time were from Campania in Naples, uh, and in Sicily from Palermo, which is right about here. And very often they'd go from Palermo to Naples and then, and then on their way across the, across the Atlantic Ocean. All right. Now, Italy did not look like this when, well, prior to 1861. And that's what we're gonna just have briefly talk about. Prior to 1861, it looked something like this. This is what the South looked like <coughs> prior to 1861. You don't see any Calabria and Basilicata and, and Puglia. No, what you see is the kingdom of the two 
Sicilies. This was a kingdom. And I like to tell, uh, and when I tell this story, it's not a story, I tell this history. When I tell this history, a lot of times people say, Italy only became a country in 1861? I mean, they don't realize it. It's a very young country as a country. Prior to 1861, you had um, you know, the Kingdom of Sardinia, you had the Papal States, which was right across the center. The Kingdom of Sardinia was also over here, it had two, and where Sardinia is today. Um, you also had Tuscany, um, Venezia, which is where Venice is, um, Parma, Lombardia. These were city-states, um, but this whole area was one kingdom. And what I like, to, what I like people to realize is in the Kingdom of the Two Sicilies, prior to 1822, there were only two classes of people. Prior to 1822, there were the aristocracy, the landowners, and everybody else. And prior to 1882, everybody else was a serf. You know, the difference between a serf and a slave, a serf can't leave the land. A, ser a slave can be sold from one landowner to another, but a slave, a serf cannot be sold from one landowner to another. So you were indentured to the land for life prior to that. So the people that were coming in the latter part of the 19th century 18, were the grandchildren, children and grandchildren of these serfs. And this was a terribly, this wasn't just, a, if I say agricultural, it sounds pastoral. It sounds like it was like this farming community that was, you know, this, this wonderful area where they had, one, you know, where it's just a pastoral scene with lots of fruit and vegetables. No, 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 no. <laughs> it wasn't like that at all. You know, Washington Irving described Sicily as the conditions of the peasants there worse than the conditions for the freed Africans in, so in the south of the United States. I mean, they were living in dirt huts. No windows, the windows were holes in the walls, dirt, dirt on the floor. You know, they had, for water, they had to go down to the stream to bring it back up. You know, the bathroom was a hole in the ground behind the house. This was not exactly what I would call, you know, a, a wonderful condition. But this is what the kingdom of the two Sicilies provided. And even after the serfs were emancipated, conditions didn't change. Now they became tenant farmers. And they had no land. So they had a bar, so they had a, for tenants on the land, almost everything they produced went to back to the overlords. So they didn't eat, even though they produced food, they were starving. There was not enough for them. There was no opportunity, no possibility, no educational system, no road to transportation. It's pretty terrible. So the first opportunity they got, they left. But in order to unify the country, in the early part of the 19th century, there were some famous people that made that happen. This is Giuseppe Mazzini. He is considered to be the, the heart or the brain and of the heart of the, of the operation. He started the Italy Society back in the 18, early 18, 1800s, and <clears throat> he championed the cause of a united peninsula to become Italy. Um, he, of course, was the, was the heart, but Camillo, Cam the Count Camillo Cavour, who was the um, the Prime Minister of, of, of the Piedmonte region, was the brains that was able to, to make that happen. He united the entire north. But it took one other gentleman, Giuseppe Garibaldi, who's wearing his poncho because he was in South America before he came to, went back to Italy, um, to unite it. He's the George Washington, for those of you who don't know, of, of Italy. And just like George Washington, he refused to be king. You know, he when he turned over when he turned over the uh, kingdom of the the kingdom of the two Sicilies to uh, Umberto, um, the uh, king of the king of the king of the uh, Savoy, uh, which now became all of this this area up here. Um, he just ref he just walked away, and you know went went off into the or into the sunset, so to speak. Now Garibaldi did this in 1860 by taking a ship all the way down to Mars to Marsala in Sicily, where <clears throat> he united with the partisans and fought his way across the Straits of Messina and then up near Naples, and where he handed over the kingdom. And in, do in doing this uh, courageous act, he united both the kingdom of the two Sicilies with 
the city states that now had become part of the um, the kingdom the kingdom of Sardinia the whole kingdom of Sardinia and the whole thing was now reunited in one country Italy okay so it's so it's so it's now united um, and it looks something like this because these were not broken up into regions at that time okay this is this is Umberto King Umberto who was the who became the king of the first king of the first king of Italy so it became a constitutional monarchy, but even as a, the, the conditions of, the, of the, the peasants did not change in these areas, even though now it was a um, now now it was one one country. These these uh, areas eventually developed into their own regions, and now Italy, of course, has twenty regions. At the same time, a mass means of transportation is developing, and these are the steamships that make it possible for transatlantic travel on a regular basis. And I just found out from some of the research I'm doing that my, grand, my great grandfather, great grandfather who came to America, Bartolomeo, um, went back and forth several times. You know, and that, I, 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 it not, was not unusual. Yet the trip took anywhere from three to four weeks, one way, to cross the Atlantic Ocean at that time. And they would go in these tram steamers. Now this is what it looked like when they were allowed to come up on top of the ship once a day for fresh air. <coughs> for the rest of the time, they were all in the bottom of the ship. Now if anybody's seen the movie Golden Door, mm -hmm. anybody? That'll give you some idea as to what it looked like. And those, I think, are almost pristine conditions that you see in Golden Door. It was even worse than that but they were allowed to come up on top once a day for air. Now the men, as I did in the exhibit, I had the New York Historical Society in the bunk beds. The men slept on one side of the ship and the women slept on the other. And you know, the ch women and children on the other side. And they weren't supposed to get together for the whole trip, no, but who knows what happened. In any case, there were, a lot of, there were a lot of things that happened on those trips. Not all good, not all good. But when you consider the conditions I described that they were leaving and the conditions they were coming to, it was like they had died and gone to heaven. Exactly. This was Nirvana or Oz to them. Can you imagine coming into New York Harbor and seeing skyscrapers? I mean, and gleaming lights off of these buildings that these rural country peasants had seen for the first time <coughs> in their lives? I mean, it was spectacular. And of course, the Madonna was meeting them in the harbor. Yeah. So this was this was this was this is what they this is what you know, they, they they died and gone to heaven. Of course, they had to be processed before they got to heaven, and they were processed at Ellis Island. This is the Great Hall, Great Hall of Ellis Island. As a matter of fact, I was given that picture that you that you can look at after, which was in Life magazine in 1983 of um, of the Mizuka family, and that's all the relatives from that family. That uh, from the one woman who's sitting in the front, um, who came here, and that all her offspring is with her. Um, to give you an idea. So this was a very, this was a very, and you know the stories about. I don't need to tell you the stories, but you you know the stories. You've all seen movies about it, where people would turn back. Well, that wasn't so much. Not as much as not as much as the we, people would like us to believe. Primarily because it cost the captains of the ships money, if they had to bring you back. So they had doctors, as they did, if you remember in Golden Door, those of you saw it, there were doctors examining the, the people before they got on the ship. That was, a, that was a must, because if you weren't healthy, they didn't want you on the ship in the first place, because if you got to Ellis Island and you had to be sent back, the captain had to pay for the, you to go back. So they really were very careful, tried to be as careful as they could not, to get as many healthy people as possible. But of course, some did have to return. But then some again, as I said, went back, went back and forth. Um, and, and this is another picture. This is a later picture in the 1950s. People greeting each people after World War II, greeting people on the docks. Now, these are some examples of some of the passports that they, you know, that they had at, at the time. Certificates of citizenship, um, passports. This is the. This one is in, in the third showcase, actually, back there. This one. This one is from the kingdom of the, when it was when it was a kingdom. This is from 1860. This one up here, before. yeah, before the unification. 
Now, I have to tell you a little bit about the story that goes behind this one. Um, when, they, when they arrived here, of course, they had been told, nobody believed it though, don't, you know, that the streets were paved with gold. <laughs> Mario Cuomo used to like to say, you know, they were told the streets were paved with coal, gold, but instead they had to pave the streets. Well, in truth, they did pave the streets. There was a lot of, and as farm, farm laborers, that's basically what they knew, um, to, work with the, to work with their hands, and they did a lot of that. Um, and but the conditions were so much better here than they were in Italy. I mean, here, if you worked, you got paid. Now that may sound like a unique thing, but in Italy it wasn't. Matter of fact, today you could work all, you know, today. In 2013 you could work in Southern Italy and not get paid all week long. It still could happen because, you know, there just isn't any money. So that, that happened, that still happened, that still does happen today um, so in some places. But if you worked here, you got paid, and then you could eat well. You know, I mean, I remember 20 years ago um, interviewing some of the immigrants who came in the, during the immigration period, and one in particular uh, saying to me that, you know, I asked him, why didn't you ever go back? He says, go back. He says, this is my country. I said, that, there was nothing there for me. The new immigrants that come from Italy today don't understand this because it's, things have changed somewhat. But you know there was nothing there for them. They wanted to become American. They wanted to be. They wanted to be, be like the. They wanted to be the. They wanted to be American. And Italy was such a young country. There was no history of it as a country either. So when people were identified with being Napolitan or Calabrese or Sicilian, that made more sense to them because that was their region. They didn't really identify with Italy as a country yet. All right. But they came here in the conditions that they that they had. You know, in the housing, in the houses, they had these tenement buildings, of course. This isn't the tenement building, but you'd have railroad railroad apartments with a window in the front and a window all the way in the back, and no windows on the side because you'd be between two buildings. And that, but when they were in Italy, they had dirt floors, and you know, and you know, they had to go down to the stream to get the water. They had coal running water in the apartments, cold, not hot, but at least they had coal running water. So that was a big improvement for them. Um, and as I said, they got paid, they ate, and they could eat well, and they could raise a family. Most of the Italian immigrants that came were more concerned in that period with survival. They were concerned as Maslow, and those of you, I know there are a lot of educators in this room, Maslow's hierarchical scale, you know, food, clothing, and shelter. That's what they were concerned about. Second generation got educated, more educated. It took much more, some of the first did, but more of the second. You know, much more of the second. And the third generation, I mean, they, 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 they're, they've got plenty of education. They're upper middle class, middle class, upper middle class, economically amongst the amongst everybody, the highest in America today. So they've done, they've they've succeeded in, in, in becoming in being successful in the in with education and with in, in economics over over three generations. The first generation did not do this. It was the second and third generation that made that this happen with. Now you'd arrive here. You'd arrive here on Mulberry Street, and you know you, who would you want, or or because this was the biggest street. Um, and if you came from Naples, you'd be living on Mulberry Street because this is where the Neapolitan people came. Why did they come here? They came by chain migration, one person chain, one link in a chain would tell another link in a chain. Another. So you you'd write to your countrymen. You couldn't write yourself, so you'd come to have somebody to write it for you. So where did you go? You went to a banca, bank. You went there were a lot of these little banks, like this one that's here now. This is Banca Stabile. But you'd go to the banker, and he had a little more education than you did. <laughs> Not much, <laughs> but enough to be able to write a letter. He'd write a letter back to back to the uh, to, to to in this case to Naples, saying tell you tell your countrymen or your your paisan. Uh, that you that you had it, there were jobs here that I can get you work and you can live with me in my apartment. So you write the letter he, they, and I'll lend you the money to come. Or the bank would lend them the money to come. Uh, the bank did a lot of that because they were patrons. They would they would go to Italy and they would post that there were jobs in America, and if and the people would take the jobs and they would have to pay them back the transportation, at, you know, at a reasonable rate. Sometimes not reasonable, but in this case with this bank it was reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and they would they would get to America. So there was the, all these little shops and all these little stores, and people <laughs> defined. And, and as we as I talked about Italy in 1861, it really wasn't a unified country yet. All right, there was no common language. It, Italian as you know it today was not Italian. 
I mean, they spoke dialects or sometimes languages. I mean, in certain parts, in certain parts of Calabria, they actually still speak Abresh, which is like a, like an, a, like a, like the Albanians. Um, in, in Sicily, the Sicilian language, it's a language. It's really not even, most people don't consider it to be a dialect. <coughs> Neapolitans consider it to be a dialect. Calab Cal 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 I'm not supposed to say Calabrese anymore. It's Calabrian, um, that I've been told. You know? and so it, it's a, it's, it's, it's a, we're all these different languages. So you would go to somebody who could speak your language. In this case, this was Bankastabli. He spoke Neapolitan. And Neapolitan was the language on the street. If you were on Elizabeth Street, the language was Sicilian, right? Mm -hmm. You know, because the Sicilians all congregated there. So each street had its own, you know, uh, language or people from that particular particular area, and that's 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 what happened. This is Bankastabli. This picture. This is this is the first Bankastabli, not the one you're sitting in. Um, this was this was at 74 Mulberry Street, which is on the other side of the canal. Right, later on, when Francesco, and that's his son Jerome, when Francesco got successful, he went on to he went on he went on to um, build a, to have another office at 131 Mulberry Street, which is where the novelty store is down here, next to SPQR that just closed. All right, and and this is and this and then in 1882. He started building this corner, and he built all five of these buildings, and he put his bank here, and he operated here as a bank until 1932. He died in 1920, but the bank operated until 1932. The depression closed them down. They actually were licensed by the state of New York as a bank. Many of these places around here were not licensed, but they were. Um, but they had to close in 1932 because they didn't have enough money on deposit. They moved the money to Banco de Commerciale, um, which is which is was still in existence. Back with the commercial reality Italia, and nobody nobody lost any money. But if you walked up and down on Mulberry Street, this is 243 Mulberry Street, you would see stores like this. All right? And this was of course, they sold lasagna, all right, you know, it did bread, bread, and of course the cans of tomatoes in the window as well. All right?